Thank you, Fiona. Thanks. Wonderful as ever, and great to have the uh, badges mentioned too. It's uh, an initiative from Ox that's uh, a great way of keeping track of all the things that you participate in. So I'm Theresa McKinnon. I'm the chair of the Open Ed uh, Special Interest Group. Um, but really, today's session has been instigated by Monica and Kat. So let's uh, hear from them. Well, it's a collaboration, Teresa. So I am the co-chair of the Anti-Racism and Learning Technology Special Interest Group. And Kat, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kat Allen and I am from Kew University and I am the Faculty Learning Technology Officer. Thank you. So today we are aiming for an interactive session and we want to gather your thoughts. But Teresa, would you like to just explain people a little bit if they're not sure about how to use the platform? Sure, yeah. So if you're not familiar with um, Blackboard Collaborate, I'm sure many of you are by now, um, there's just, uh, you'll find the important things hidden away under the pink button at the bottom right of the screen. So if you want to join the chat, you'll see the speech bubble there once you open that that uh, um, button, once you click on that button and slide the panel, you can also see the attendees and message people. And um, of course, you can use your emot emoticons as well as we go through and give us some reaction. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the anti-racism and learning technology special interest group. It's a huge name, isn't it? We start, we formed as a community of practice back in 2020, middle of lockdown. Um, I think personally, I can say that it was a great way to connect with colleagues in such difficult situation we were in back in 2020. So Madlinger and myself initiated this and now it has become a special interest group. So we have three areas of activity. The first one is um, staff development. Um, and we discuss, do research, and try to influence practice in terms of how anti-racism is embedded and how we can take accountability for our own development as well. I think that's very important in learning technology. Um, to become more conscious and aware and develop ourselves as professionals. The second area of work is the content development special um, sub, subgroup. Um, so at the moment they're creating a toolkit that you can audit your practice, how you develop material. So really exciting, interesting things. And the last area of activity, the third one, is the research-oriented um, research connected activities. So research in the area of anti-racism, um, anti-racist pedagogy, critical pedagogies, um, critical digital pedagogies as well. So if you are interested, we have a series of blog posts you can find in the old blog. Um, we have around four or five if I'm not wrong and you can find out a little bit more about us. Now, Teresa. Thank you, Monica. And the Open Ed SIG actually has been around since 2012. Um, it predates my involvement. Um, and it was really sort of started as a, um, a support group for um, people using open educational resources. But it's developed much further than that. Um, and really, you'll find uh, our mission and our mission statement and the information about what we do um, on the Open Ed SIG page here, which I'm just going to pop in the chat for you. Um, hopefully you came across, or some of you at least, will have come across today's webinar through our community space. So um, our mission essentially is to uh, focus on supporting open practice. And open, as we know, is complex and contextual. Uh, it's not about necessarily everybody sharing everything but it very much is about addressing some of the inequalities that we see in education and some of the, um, the bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, that goes on in these spaces. Um, we have a community space. We also exist on Twitter there too. So we're very, very supportive of the aims um, of the uh, racism SIG, the relatively new SIG. Um, and also FenEd Tech and other networks within the alt community um, that are 
striving to help address issues of bias and inequality um, in education. Right, so our aim for today is to, we have three aims. The first one is to introduce intersectionality as a lens to approach learning technology. And I think mm, Teresa and I had a few conversations about this. I myself, I'm not a scholar on intersectionality. I like to find frameworks and rely on theory and evidence-based solutions to approach real world challenges. So I speak for myself, I'm not a scholar in intersectionality or decolonizing as well, but I am very enthusiastic about changing practice and being more open and inclusivity. So we're going to introduce this lens, which I have explored, and if I can study it with curiosity to be applied into a specific field, which is learning technology, I think we all can do it. So our aim is just to introduce you, make you aware that this exists, beyond um, decolonizing, be, beyond racism and anti-racism uh, is a good lens to approach real world challenges in education and in learning technology. Our second aim, we have three questions from the many questions and issues we can encounter in our practice. Um, we came up with three questions that seem to be the most intriguing, at least from our point of view. Um, Propose some evidence based. There is a lot of research, there are a lot of interventions done, and um, we're just going to cover very briefly a couple of them so you, you can get started maybe exploring in your own practice what, what will work for you in your context. And propose a way forward. If more than that, it's a final thought. I guess the main aim for us today is for you to consider intersectionality as a lens to explore the different areas of practice uh, for you. Okay, so like Teresa mentioned, um, there the, the work the Open um, Education um, Special Interest Group, what they do is a lot about inclusion, highlighting inequalities. So if we are to dismantle the way things are, power structures, I don't think, we don't think that we can approach it from one lens only. It's not only about racism or the patriarchy or gender. I think it's intersectional. And decolonizing has a, a lot of merit, um, but it's very much focused on the historical aspect. And it's good to kind of explore, but it goes beyond because you have to consider every individual and their circumstances and their person and the different factors in that person. Um, and now Kat is going to tell you a little bit about intersectionality, what it is and where it comes from. Thank you very much, um, Monica. Um, intersectionality is, according to Collins and Blige, Thank you, Ken. It defines intersectionality as a way of understanding and analyzing the complex, the complexity in the world, our human experiences. And um, we understand that we've obviously got social inequalities and um, the people's lives, there's organization, power structures. And what it is that we're looking at is it's just not shaped by just one single social axis. So whether we're looking at race, gender, class, the very many axes that work together and influence each other. So intersectionality as an analytic tool gives people better access to the complexity of the world and of ourselves. Now, sometimes I'll give from my perspective, when I listen to that, I think, okay, so how does that apply to me then? Just based on that definition. So if we look at age, nationality, ethnicity, physical appearances, relationship status, seniority, whether you're in management, internal, external, organizational, as you can see, there's a lot to take in here. 
so Kimberly Crenshaw actually is really good at defining this. She essentially had coined um, intersectionality. And so this is a framework that Thomas et al. in 2021 have actually been using as well. So one of the things that I personally find in terms of the complexity is how then do we define intersectionality? Because there's that aspect of it from the the way we see things but then there's also how we feel things how we use our emotions how our memory works our networks our families our you know there's a, it's a complexity so it's this that we're trying to then put it into then the context of racism and then how it is that then we can be able it plays its part so that's intersectionality sorry actually it's not about racism it's a lot of other things sorry i can guess i'm thinking about myself in this instance so, <laughs> so if you just bear with me so yes um uh if you could just go to the next slide please so just bear with me. sorry bear with me i've got so many windows open at the moment um and I think I've just recognized that I've been looking at you from another screen altogether. <laughs> so here we go. I'd like to try something new. Those of you who are able, please stand up. Okay, so I'm going to name some names. When you hear a name that you don't recognize, you can't tell me anything about them, I'd like you to take a seat and stay seated. The last. Okay, I'll pause in this instance. So, unless you have your cameras on, I can't quite see the chat as well because there's several. Cut. Yes, go I don't. I think, I think people couldn't watch any of the video. Um, that you play, ah. but if you go to YouTube or to TED Talks and you type Kimberly's um, name, right. you can watch the full TED Talk. It's like 17 minutes, so maybe we yeah. can watch the whole thing, but it's very, very interesting, um, and who, she can explain you much better than any of us what intersectionality is, and it's a very touching uh, presentation. I really enjoyed watching it, so we recommend it. And also, I think one of the things that I probably would say as well is just simply touching on it as well, just simply having a look at how she defines it. And it's interesting that I think we we'll all have different opinions about that. So thank you for that link, Teresa. I'm not able to see. I apologize. I'm having multiple screens that I'm working with today. I'm also having a look at the chat. Thank you for that video. Yeah. So, no um, okay. I've, I've shared the video link in the chat for those people who didn't see the, the um, uh, video coming through, so you can open it on your own computers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we're really, we're really indebted to Kat's experience and lived experience in order to understand better. Uh, and that's really the importance of having so many of us together today, because as Kat explained, intersectionality is all about the many different experiences we bring to the picture. Um, I'm just going to share with you uh, a link from, from some work that's been done by the um, Association for Learning Technology members and people who were interested in thinking about values in learning technology um, and some work that went on uh, with the help of uh, Sharon Flynn and others uh, to mobilize the community and get us talking about what our values are, which is an area that we've talked about a lot in um, the open education um, community for, for many years, um, and led to the development of a framework. Now, I'm also going to share with you, because there's a tendency to think, okay, well, that's a framework, and that's sort of everything defined and done and finished. It so isn't. I'm just going to share with you another link to some uh, slides that were put together in 
2019, I think, no, 2021. So not, not, so a sort of report back. So when Alt decided to look at um, ethics within learning technology, um, they started with trying to mobilize the community and getting people to share their lived experience and to think about their values in learning technology. And, and this framework for ethical learning technology is an ongoing work in progress. So the slides I've just shown, um, shared in the chat are a sort of one point in time on route to the um, web page that you can see on Alt's um, ethical framework um, that's shared, that was shared in the earlier link. Um, so essentially, this is ongoing work. This is about reflecting, as, as both Kat and Monica have pointed out, reflecting on who we are, on our lived experience, on, um, on how we operationalize our values. Um, and what really impressed me when I spoke with Monica was how she wanted to put the emphasis on operationalizing theory. Um, and, and theory for many of us isn't terribly easily accessible. So that's really why we, we are holding this webinar today, because the only way we can really operationalize things is to actually even be aware of how we work and what we do and to listen to each other uh, and to get different perspectives. So we're going to be um, asking you to anonymously contribute some of your lived experience in order for us to broaden our overall picture of how um, this very complicated onion um, that was described so well by Kat um, plays out uh, in, in our life and in our work uh, and to get a broader picture. And, and that's that same process as was used in developing the framework for ethical learning technology, the felt model that we've shared with you there. Thanks, Monica. I'll share the link now to our Jamboard, and I'm just I'm going to share this um, on the screen as well in case people haven't necessarily used a Jamboard before. So I'll just put the link into the chat first so that you can open it on one of the 6,000 tabs that no doubt you've already got open. <laughs> and I'm Thank just you. Share, that. I'll, I'll let you read question one perhaps first, Monica, and then I'll okay. share my screen with the Jamboard. Okay, thanks. So we wanted to include three questions, and I'm going to get a little bit philosophical here. It's about belonging, and I we keep seeing these more and more. And what does belonging even mean? Uh, that that was my first question when I I spoke to Trace and Kat. Um, what does it mean? And there are so many definitions. It's a psychological construct. And I think a lot of people feel that don't have a psychology background to say, well, you can measure belonging. And actually that's not true. So we agreed on, on a definition. You can see it's a bit old from 1993, but it's very, very, very widely used. So it's about acceptance, respect, inclusion, and support in, a, in an educational environment. So there's a lot of studies done on belonging. I personally like this definition a lot. So my question, the question we want to ask you and gather your thoughts is in your context, in your experiences, in whatever role you are, learning technologies, educational developer, maybe you're in a management position or digital learning something, um, do you feel like students feel like they belong into the educational system? And at the end, uh, we're going to present an example of one intervention, uh, which I found really interesting and very, you can replicate it and very clear is a model that you can use to kind of embed this, because I hear a lot of, we are going to embed, embed technologies to enhance belonging, and I don't even know what that means. So I'm curious about your thoughts and what you think belonging is, and if the students, the educational experience they get, make them feel in such way. So uh, Teresa has put a link in the chat and she's going to show now that's the first question. In your experiences as a professional, 
the students feel like they belong in the, the um, educational system and te technological system. So sometimes technology separates more than bring together, make you feel included as well. Yes, thank so you just, for that, Monica. <laughs> Let's, uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen now just showing the Jamboard and I just wanted to make sure that people know um, how to participate in the Jamboard because as we said, there yes. are going to be three questions that you can um, share your experience with us on um, and, and you don't have to be an expert on this. We're really not looking for, we're looking for your lived experience. We're looking for what you have noticed uh, and we're all at different points in this journey, really, of, of unpeeling an onion uh, of complexity and thinking perhaps about how our experience may be and our um, concepts of things may be different from others. Um, so just to show you, in order to contribute, um, you use the um, little fourth icon down, the little um, post-it note, um, choose which colour post-it note you want to use, type into it and just press enter for it to appear on the screen. And as they appear, we can move those around to make sure everybody can read them. And at the top of the screen, you'll see there are three questions. So you can navigate through this at your own speed and have a look at the other questions. Um, as you can see, Monica is going to talk you through the other questions in a moment. So we're just going to leave this Jamboard open so you can move through at your own time. And uh, in that first question, as Monica's explained, we're thinking about belonging. And probably a lot of us have, have had thoughts around belonging um, when we talk about the student experience. Um, but one of the things I think we tend to do is to make assumptions, because for all of us, making assumptions is a quicker way of making sense of the world. Um, so what have we found out and i'm really interested to see that uh, during covid that has made us perhaps question our assumptions about what students can do so it's really good to see these uh, comments coming in uh, and finding their way onto the jamboard so thank you very much for that i'll stop sharing my screen now so you can see that's going on in the background and i'll come back to monica's second question Okay, Fab, thank you. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen now, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so second question, uh, and this is about culture, and it's such a difficult concept um, as well. Uh, how can we create a culture of inclusion and belonging in learning technology? And this feels into every area. It could be organizationally, could be in our own practice and then in turn it affects the students as well our daily interactions in, with our colleagues um, so like I mentioned at the beginning it's not as simple as saying we're going to tackle racism or we're going to um, just deal with this one area of disadvantaged groups or minoritized groups you have to approach it from, that's why intersectionality is so great, because it goes beyond the simplistic view. It goes from the individual to the structural to the organization. And that paper, which we're citing in on the slide, presents a really good solution. Um, it's called the Intersectionality Walk, and it's a series of um, active kind of um, uh, experiences that you immerse yourself as another person. Um, anyway, but be, be, before I take you into that, we would like to hear your thoughts if you go to the board, um, to the jam board, and share in your own context, with your insights, with your own experiences, how, if you have witnessed attempts or it has worked for you, also please do share, um, because we're interested in knowing what has worked or what you would like to see to create that culture of inclusion in learning technology. Okay, and to me, this is the most challenging question because it's about change and changing practice. And um, we had a really good discussion when we were planning for the presentation personally, attending academic 
theory-oriented presentations don't have an impact on me as much as I, I would like. And we talked about this because we said we're not scholars on intersectionality or decolonization or anti-racism um, or anti-racist pedagogy. Um, so what really worked for us and what really worked for you? I think at some level we have several models of CPD institutionally um, and ALT also offers, for example, this very webinar. But I'm curious about how do you enact that change? Because it seems to me that CPD is a lot about the accumulation of knowledge as opposed to taking action. Because it is a very tiring and expensive thing to do to actually implement some of these themes around inclusion or anti-racism or intersectionality and change how you approach technology or learning design. So um, here I just listed several models um, from training, you know, unconscious bias training, anybody, I personally think that they don't work or they work up to a very minimum uh, level and to transformative models. And the transformative model of CPD is a combination of all the models that you see in there. So I'm curious, how do you change practice? What works for you? Me, I have, I have to put myself through a lot of reflection and failing, implementing failing and pivoting and trying again. Um, and it is a lot about time um, as opposed to just picking a book. So please share your thoughts. What do you think? How do we change practice? How do we become more inclusive, more conscious of that intersectional lens? Okay. Okay. So that's that's great. I'm, going, um, I'm just I'm just conscious yes. that I'm typing in the background into my Jamboard so I switch my mic off. Um, but I think it's really important that we give people now enough time just to navigate that. Um, okay. Uh, the the things that are coming into the Jamboard because there's some brilliant um, thoughts appearing, um, and perhaps we just. Uh, it's, it's, this is always really difficult to do in a webinar without sort of putting some background music on or something. But we perhaps just give people okay. a couple of minutes just quietly to um, to read and reflect. Um, as we mentioned, time matters and often people don't get the time that they need to think deeply about things. So maybe we'll have just a couple of minutes here with uh, reading each other's comments and learning from each other's experience. That's fine. Um, Teresa, can you please share that, that screen um, of the Jamboard? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll do that. I just finished typing. OK, so I'm going to share my screen so that people can watch what's going on in the Jamboard if they're not doing that already and um, hum to yourselves while you think. <laughs> right so as we can see we've got lots of comments coming in um, and, and I think uh, as we were talking this through Monica and I we, we realize very quickly that this is not just about just just as such a thing uh, about racism it's about a broader biases as well to in, in to lots of aspects it's about that intersectionality the many um, differences contextually of our worldview and our life experience and our values um, and having time uh, to think about these Yeah, so belonging, how can people feel they belong if actually they, you know, the tools that they're given to use as part of their training or part of their degree um, are irrelevant once they finish their degree? So they're, they're kind of visitors in an environment for a while. How, how can we support that sort of feeling of belonging and um, reflect how important uh, 
their life experience is to us as practitioners. Um, if I jump onto um, screen two, you can see we've got lots of things coming coming through here about creating a culture of belonging. Yes, digital poverty, or as I like to call it, poverty. Let's add comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these assumptions, and I think we particularly saw it in um, in the pandemic when the pandemic first came up, was that there were assumptions that everybody would go home, and of course everybody would go home to homes that had sufficient bandwidth and sufficient devices for everybody to continue working and you know those sort of uh, assumptions were exposed for exactly what they are really just false just um, you know, there was an awful lot of work that had to be done and thank goodness a lot of research uh, published as a, as a result of those lived experiences yes I think that I like, we need to stop thinking about students looking a certain way, that students are 18 year olds from the same culture and background. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we, and we, we all do it. It's a human thing. We, you know, we categorize parents. We talk about parents. We talk about students. We talk about staff. Well, in reality, as Kat was showing us, you know, that's a huge, not a homogenous group. That's a huge heterogeneous group. Um, so some, some nice ideas and some thoughts there on creating a culture of belonging. A lot of the work is just ra raising awareness and sadly many of us who perhaps are, are, have not been so marginalised in our life have not really given much thought, in-depth thought, to the, how the lived experiences of others might be different from our own. And changing practice, we're already starting to get some suggestions here. Yeah, please expand on things like, you know, we're trying to embed this across a university culture. That's a lovely point. So how how do we do that? And universal design for learning is one of the things that you're pointing to there. It's still not very widely understood. And I think there are still challenges um, for us there. Okay, Kat, are you happy for me to come back out? Uh, sorry, uh, Monica, are you happy to come back out to the to the slides again? Yes. We'll leave that Jamboard open, obviously, because people need time. Yes, yes, of course. Um, yeah, I'm going back to share my screen. So I'm going to share with you two interventions, which I really like. And personally, I, I would like to experiment um, with them, see if they work for my context. And the way I, I see it, and kind of a summary of what we have covered, is they organizationally, it's a student experience, and it's about us to change practice, the way we do things. So the first one is, I think, that's the biggest opportunity if you um, can enact change from the top or in, in, in an organization. And there is this intervention called intersectionality walk, which is Thomas' um, paper at AL in 2022. If you check the paper, I believe it's open access, so you will have access to it. Um, if you just Google intersectionality walk, it's in a, it takes you through the steps to deliver this experience in your workplace or with your team. So it's an authentic and experiential, so it's experiential learning um, that you immerse yourself and you um, embody somebody else, you become somebody else, you, you're given a description and you have to understand the challenges, for example, of that person on their first day of work or their first week at work, how it is different from you if you don't, you don't have a disability, for example, or you're not a person of color, you will change into a different person. So I find it quite interesting. Um, so it has been piloted. I think it worked quite well. Anyway, you can see in the paper, but I personally liked it a lot. For the second, the student experience and belonging seems to be key. And I saw someone write, wrote about the student voice, listen to the student voice. So yeah, our, our students do say we, we don't feel like we belong. Um, so I came across this intervention it's a belonging project and it has three layers 
It's about, you, you have to consider when you want to embed belonging activities, um, you have to consider the transition of students, especially for first year students at, at the university and undergraduates. If you do postgrad, there are other issues. I'm just focusing from that perspective. The transition, the inter, interdisciplinary richness that they can encounter at the university and that often is not very well tapped into well that, that that has been my experience perhaps you could share if your institution has a better way to create that i hate using the term cross-pollination of ideas and people but i think it is very important for students to experience when once they get to university to go beyond their own discipline their subject and finally notions of space and time so that means the learning spaces beyond the traditional classroom or the lecture room um, I know we have uh, universities in, in particular um, have done a lot of work around l informal learning spaces and how learning happens in these spaces. So they, these three areas seem to be key for embedding belonging. So three things to consider, especially when you, if you're a learning designer and or digital learning designer, you it's good to think about this this model and. The paper was quite good and I can highly recommend. And I think, Teresa, you have a couple of uh, interventions or strategies. You added uh, open guilds and then the change practice. I'm going to leave it to you. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. The, the, the open guilds really is uh, addresses the, the idea of belonging. And this was a discussion that we had at the open education SIG that's on a webinar from uh, some, some time ago now, 2015 when we were thinking about how, when we're looking at things that are complex and contextual and difficult to understand, how useful it can be to do that with other people through through communities of practice, which obviously is where the associate, the, um, the SIG, the anti-racism SIG is coming from to help coalesce ideas and support each other. Um, so I thought I would add that in as a, an additional resource. And in terms of changing practice, the, the links that I put there, one is from the Alt Journal. Um, and well, they're, in fact, they're both from the Alt Journal. But the second of those, the embedding theory into practice with toolkits, there's a, a lot of it you can see, but there's a lot of the sort of thing that open education suffers from regularly, which is when you get into the toolkits itself, themselves, they've gone offline because the project or whatever uh, that created them is no longer funded and they've disappeared. And, and this is something that the open community struggle with uh, very often. Um, so again, it's kind of part of the landscape when we're talking about sharing information openly. And it's really important. I saw just on Twitter today um, conversations going on from OE Global, which is a global conference that's going on at the moment. Um, around the importance of actually establishing some sort of formal infrastructure for um, open publications um, so that things don't just disappear when the funding runs out. Because if we're going to have these sorts of discussions and we're going to, yes, thank you, Sonia, thank you for sharing that. But, you know, that there's an awful lot of wastage that happens, a lot of intellectual and academic and um, uh, effort has been wasted because websites go down or funding runs out. Um, so it's really important that that matters to us um, and that we maintain our interest and uh, that we don't slip backwards. I think, um, you know, any of us reflecting on the situation, particularly in the UK, over the last um, 10 years or so, we would say that we slipped backwards. Uh, it's really important that we keep the pressure on to keep things moving forwards and uh, make sure that we improve things, particularly for those who are marginalised uh, and struggling for access. Thanks. Um, okay, so I think final thoughts. Um, I am um, applying this, um, any change, I would say, um, will require a multi-level approach. It starts with the self. I always say inclusion is about being aware, being self-aware. And once individuals become aware of who they are and others, 
um, then we can enact change. So I guess the invitation is to consider three different layers from the organizational point of view, from the student experience point of view, and from your own practice in learning technology. And to consider these three different solutions or approaches. So intersectionality can apply to any of, of them, but I think the organization has to be advocating for it first. Um, belonging in the student experience is key beyond um, decolonizing or it or diversifying i think the the goal is belonging and for ourselves as practitioners it's about learning and changing and transforming our own practice and being just remaining curious okay so i guess we have time for questions or any final thoughts anything the audience would like to share or Teresa and Kat, would, is there anything you would like to add? I'd, I'd like to say a really big thank you for people who've been using that Jamboard and um, sharing very openly. That's I think that's really important that we've opened those conversations. And as I say, we're all at different points on this journey, but you know we can start to have those thoughts. So I'm really grateful. Kat, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think first, importantly, just to say thank you for coming today. And um, I've, I think that as Monica and we've all talked about is that moment of reflection. There's been a lot that we, we have learned um, and it's, it feels like a very confusing time. I think I've always felt confused. Maybe that's the thing. The world is constantly changing. What it is that we knew, you know, we innovate, we disrupt we are here talking about it, the things that we wanted. We say, it was great. Then we were like, actually, that was really, no, get rid of it. Then as soon as you've gotten rid of it, you want it back. So I think from, from that sort of aspect of belonging, um, probably the biggest learning point has been around just taking time to actually sometimes point the finger back at yourself. And I think that for me has been one of the things that that has not been easy, where I have had to challenge some of my biases, some of the things that I grew up thinking were from my lens until I spoke to somebody and I often think, was I curious enough about other people? Am I curious enough? Am I, I'm actually, if I'm honest, I'm not feeling that brilliant today. And you're like, oh gosh, but how many other people are not? How are we feeling today? You know, this is what that sort of post COVID defects and, but also at the same time, I'm really thrilled that we're here. So thank you. I think thank you so much. Thank you. So just wanted, as always, you know, for me, I'd really like it's what it is that you've talked about. You know, it's just unpacking when you said somebody said it's it's confusing. So um, the web archives, it's understanding a little bit more about what is it about that's confusing. So it's that next bit of just reading the comments. We need to have more conversations, more conversations, more conversations. But we're really, really grateful for you being here as well. So thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Kat. I think it's so important. And I think the, the in the chat, there was a conversation about the Wayback Machine and, and sort of hanging on to things that we're seeing increasingly governments at government level, things disappearing because they're a story that people don't want told. Um, and, and it's very important that we you know, grab hold of our agency in these things and make sure that uh, uh, it is not possible to um, to change the uh, the management, if you like, of, of information exchange. Um, Do you know when we talk about that, actually, this is actually, I think, an excellent point. Oh, sorry, Monica. Who is the government and in which context do we mean? Oh, yeah, that's, that's, a, really, that's a very good point about this so it's who is the government is it us the people who, who added so many questions and then in which context and in which country because i've been to many places i speak very many languages and by the way I, I speak i didn't realize this i've got so many languages going on in my head wow. and i don't know how many people are so i can speak literally i can sometimes i think i'm like what's what's going on i've got so many dialects because um, I'm from Kenya and we speak, woof, okay, as of, we, and we still apparently keep unpacking more. Um, 
Uh, but anyway, let me not even get 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 that whole conversation. So who's the government? And also, we're from so many different places. So Monica as well, we've met here. We've met in different spaces. I absolutely have a lot of love for Monica. She's been such a wonderful person to deal with as well. And um, honestly, I've got, it's this, and also Teresa has been so, 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 so helpful. I love the way just listening to the way she articulates this, all of that, just that, just that honesty. And, and that, that part of what all brings and how we want to do our best for everyone, for our students, for ourselves, for... So yeah, so who's the government? That's a big question, Kat. I don't think we're gonna to get to the bottom of that right here and now. Exactly. So That's mm -hmm. I think if we just look at the way the information uh, has been shared in the West about the war in Ukraine, and we look at how the, um, the facts have been, um, exploited um, it, 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 we're increasingly having to deal with perhaps because we have so many media channels and you know so access to social media and, and the internet which has totally sort of changed uh, our networks in you know and our understanding of the world that actually dealing with complexity is is a is a core skill for us all now it's uh, you know it's something that we can't we can no longer just sort of assume that we will get um, quick solutions handed down. We have to be able to look critically at the information that we have and uh, engage in, in greater depth. And as you say, point the finger at ourselves. I love that um, analogy, that sort of thinking about, okay, well, what have I, why have I assumed that? Where am I, how am I coming at things? Um, really, really important. And um, there's I, I a think, question. Sorry, Teresa. It's Sorry, no, go ahead. Question by so Sonia, she says, how, her question is, how do we reach the people who won't come to sessions like this, who don't even know there are problems? That's the million dollar question, is it? Pound, sorry, question, isn't it? Oh, exactly. Which currency? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of, a, I mean, ha having things recorded is, is great, but I think what we have to do is look at the, at the micro level as well because each of us every single person in this uh, session today um, we've all got a responsibility to to question and to reflect uh, and to share um, where we are in our particular journey of understanding our context and understanding uh, what's going on in the world so I, th I think it's it's sometimes too easy to kind of say oh well this is something that somebody else who knows a lot more than me is going to solve uh, I think we have to do the best that we know we can do at any particular time. And if our information source changes and our perspectives change, then we change how we deal with things. But we have to take ownership of our responsibility. Uh, I think if, if that's OK, I think that's also is. You know, it's interesting when you said, as someone who quietly ignores the reminder emails about compulsory training, like risk assessments for sitting at your desk, probably not. So we're facing this internally too with regards to EDI training. We put them on, but it's only the same old interested, in brackets, interested faces that come along, not the folks who need to come. Can I give an example of that? I'm one of those people. It's just been time. We've all, you know, when we think of what is somebody else doing, they may be spending, they may be on holiday now. They've worked. They may have so many, like, we've, what, are, what are we all doing now? I've got, I don't know how many screens, you know. So I've, I've often said, as long as it's, maybe for me, I've got those questions as well. And sometimes I think, as long as it's you, sometimes you're also doing this for yourself. And then we're here contributing. So then we go back and we're from so many different institutions and then we 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 do that. So EDI, so that's actually a really good point about EDI is everyone's responsibility. So it's then understanding what is our definitions of EDI, because I I could sit down here and, you know, just looking at the names I'm, I'm reading. Um, I've had to learn a lot about um, it was literally just yesterday, I was finding out information from someone who I thought I knew very well, that was 20 years ago. I mean, I speak to him nearly every day, that's actually my brother-in-law, and found out that they've just got some 
his specialism is actually is about viruses. So he's a top specialist um, and they've just found out some breaking news about monkeypox. So that's another thing that I like the way this acronyms, you know, EDI, critical theory, CPD, all of these things that what, 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 what I have to, I've had to sit there sometimes thinking, am I, uh, can I put up my hand and actually ask or, and especially another thing, and, and I think it's also important to say this, is actually what it is that you're so scared to ask. I often think somebody else is thinking that you might as well say it. So I don't know whether anybody else would like to add on to that. I think you've really put your finger on it again, Kat. It's, you know, if we if we don't feel safe enough to ask the question, then clearly we've done something wrong. We, as in our, our um, environment to the context that we're in in any particular, in any particular moment in time, we need to feel safe to ask stupid questions like what's EDI? <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. I often think, and also, so it's a bit, so they'll say EDI and then other people put DNI and I'm like, and then other times it's affinity and belonging. And I remember being told once I'm using complicated English. I'm like, according to who? It's the, the dictionary. Let's, it evolves, it changes. So yeah, you know, but Monica, would you like to add anything to that as well? No, um, I think, um, I don't think people don't show up to this kind of training intentionally. Um, I think the threat of equality feels like oppression to them because <laughs> they're so used to a way of being and the status quo. So I think there is this fear of now is my turn because I have benefited, I have privilege. And but those are my thoughts, but nobody's trying to oppress anybody. I think you have to, I recommend the pedagogy of the oppressed, if you can read it, um, where the mm -hmm. oppressed becomes the oppressor. I don't think nobody's doing, trying to do that. Um, to me, it's very important to make that clear. No, nobody's seeking punishment or anything like that. It's just about equity and equality, uh, which is fair, I believe. Absolutely. Um, okay, we have to uh, here. And, and it's definitely about being kind. You know, we, we really don't want to be othering people. We, we want to be open and inclusive. No. And, and each of us as an individual can deliver that by having real personal close relationships with each other um, and not letting, letting people feel judged. Yeah, that's the book, Kat. Thank you. Um, I think probably you have to incentivize people. You have to invest, you have to make, do that investment, incentivize people one way with resources to attend really meaningful training that has impact and you have to be very thoughtful about it for your context. So it requires a person, normally a head of EDI, I would say, or somebody in a similar role who has that vision of where things should go in the next years and universities or colleges should invest in such person and incentivize people to attend such training because it won't come out of them um, as a choice. So th those are my thoughts and we have four minutes left. I don't know if anybody would like to, we can have this conversation forever, but any final thoughts before we say goodbye and say thank you? And I'll quickly remind people that they're going to get the incentive of an open badge for having participated today and we're very grateful and I think it's really important that ALT does recognise those people who take time out of their day to uh, get engaged in, a, in CPD sessions so please display your badge proudly as an ALT participant. Maybe then somebody will ask how did you get that and what did you do? <laughs> yeah that's true. Okay, well, I think Kat, is there anything you would like to add yeah, before? Actually, speaking about how it is that we all share knowledge, I worked with my colleague who would keep saying, I'm like, oh, you need to attend all. And it was actually more about the person, it wasn't actually about the event. So they mentioned, so they went down, they're like, oh, Marin is so lovely. And I'm like, oh, okay. 
and it's like oh and we met so and so so it's actually the, what comes back when we all go back to our various places and how it is that we feel about this whether if sometimes you actually really resent something is that reflection of why you know and then when you love it so just the fact that you're here today bonus points get your badge your stars thank you <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks everyone. It was a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, sign up for our respective uh, special interest group and we look forward to seeing you sometime in one of our meetings.